everyone, welcome. I'm Parisa Shelton, and today we are going to have a really fascinating and exciting cutting edge conversation with one of my favorite humans, Chris Shelton and David Massey. Both of these guys are Chinese medicine, energy medicine, practitioners, healers of the body. If you have something wrong with you, call these guys because they will help you resolve whatever it is that you're going through. So hello, David, and hello, Chris. Hi. Hi. Hi good there. Hi, Phil. Nice to see you. Nice to see you guys looking good today. We have David here in the south of France, and Chris and I are in Los Angeles, California. So let's get started by first, um, each of you, just give us a quick update of how you got started in this field. I came towards Chinese medicine uh, because my, my father was very sick when I was uh, young. He, he had a multiple sclerosis. So um, I was kind of, you know, from about the age of three, I guess, I was kind of um, trying to help out how I could. Um, so I kind of went into this kind of uh, healer mode, you know, which is, is you know, became something of a, a problem for me actually later on. I kind of got stuck in, in that picture of, of living and being. Um, and I... I I think I went towards Chinese medicine fundamentally to kind of engage with with him and, and, and problems of issues with medicine where there wasn't any possible alternative uh, from Western perspective. Uh, so I wanted to find alternative approaches to see if I could help. But then later on, it became something where I realized actually it was me that needed <laughs> that needed help. And I, I moved towards... Uh, trying to understand depression, you know, difficulties like that, more psychological uh, things for myself. I went towards lots of different forms of ancient medicine, focusing very strongly on Chinese medicine, uh, particularly with Tai Chi and Qigong uh, to begin with, and then nutritional medicine, uh, herbal medicine and acupuncture. And I studied those in England and then I studied in Japan as well. I did uh, a lot of that and then I had uh, my own practice and then I went towards these other type of ancient shamanic medicine from different parts of the world, um, particularly um, in Gabon, in, in uh, cent Central West Africa, and understood other forms of treatment like that. Yeah, so that was, that was my routine. I think that all of that sort of culminated in me investigating. The strongest thing that I wanted to investigate was how the body has a kind of instinctive healing response. Focused study and looking was about really understanding what that was about, what, that how the, the, the body spontaneously heals, instinctive quality that actually allows humans to heal and all animals and plants to heal as well. So that was where I was, what I was really interested in. That's my story. That's so cool. And that is, that's so interesting. We're definitely on the same page in, in terms of facilitating the body's innate ability to heal itself. And the other quick thing, uh, Chris will talk about that, which also connects you guys, is that Chris's mom also had MS. And died oh, from wow. it. And died from it, oh, yeah. So Mr. Chris, how did you get the quick version? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because we work together also, she's heard my story so many times, and she's like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, like uh, Snoopy and the Peanuts, you know, Charlie Brown, the teacher's like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, she's like, blah, 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 blah. so. <laughs> How do I, what's my signal to wrap it up? <laughs> she goes like this to me. Oh, my God. <laughs> I got to <laughs> shut up, all right. <laughs> Interesting about my mom having MS is that she was a nurse. As you and I spoke a little bit ago, you know, there was no, I didn't plan on, uh, becoming a healer, getting involved with Chinese medicine or Qigong. Uh, I was always interested in medicine, though. My mom was a nurse, and so I would read her nursing journals at a young age because I liked to draw, and you know, I ended up doing my EP studies in art in high school and such. I would draw the different cells and those types of things. So when other kids were doing book reports on the American Indians, I'd be doing book reports on blood plasma and hematomas and those kinds of things. So I enjoyed learning about how the body functioned, but it was not on my radar. In my case, I believe my mom's MS, though, came about because of her emotional trauma. And then she used over-the-counter medications to medicate that. So I grew up in a very dysfunctional home, a lot of violence inside the home and uh, neglect. I started working at age 11 
and um, by age 12, you know, I started doing uh, drugs, started doing uh, speed balls, which is heroin and coke, but I wasn't shooting, I was snorting it. Uh, I always had a lot of drive, though, self-motivation, because my older half-brother was in trouble with the law all the time. He's in and out of juvie, and then, you know, they sent him to the boys' ranch. He would escape from the boys' ranch. He'd go to CYA. So a lot of the attention went to him, and I didn't want to end up like him. Somehow, through all those years of high school, I managed to maintain my grades and those kinds of things and still strive, try to be something more than what my parents were able to provide really for myself. So going into my senior year in high school, is right before my 19th birthday, uh, my birthday's in September, I had my first heart attack from a meth overdose. Uh, a couple of months after that, I used again, had another heart attack, led me to a physician that other doctors saying, Chris, you, you know, you need to have back surgery, otherwise you might not walk or have sex again. And this other physician, she had a therapist working for her and he was a martial artist. And this is over 30 years ago. And he started talking to me about chi and, you know, I'm what, 20 years old now, I think. And I was like, oh yeah, right. The closest thing I'm going to get to chi is like cheese its and cheese whiz. I started taking these Qigong classes. I had all kinds of health issues, digestive issues, I lived on all kinds of medications, I had all kinds of sinus issues, seasonal allergies, especially in the Indian summer months and in the spring months and such. After about six months of taking these Qigong classes, you know, I couldn't tell you when, but it was all of a sudden the realization like, oh wow, when did I stop living on the antibiotics when I stopped living on the Tums and the Sudafed and stuff. So that's when I thought, man, it'd be simple practice. A specific movement meditation could do this to me. There must be something to the medicine. So that's when I started studying classical Chinese medicine. That's how I got the start. And, you know, prove the doctors wrong because, like I said, the Taekwondo injury from being kicked in the low back accidentally, doctors went from saying, well, Chris might not walk again to where it was like, oh, well, Chris will walk, but he won't train again. Then it was like, well, Chris will train, but he'll never fight again. And I did my last amateur fights in kickboxing and Tai Chi at age 40. I was able to prove them wrong and all of that. So that's how, that's how I got the start. Interesting story. And it's Chen Tai Chi, isn't it? Uh, which mm -hmm. is also my, uh, I, 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 I do, I studied that's, Chen. The, that's what I saw. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. And my teachers are uh, Mark Leonard and, and um, in the UK. And then sometimes I, I've been able to, to, to meet uh, 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 Chen Ying, Ying Jun for the, the oh. mm -hmm. so, uh, Chen Jia Wang's first uh, yeah. uh, eldest son, you know. So it's, uh, I really have found that uh, really vital. That's the, the kind of vital line for me of, of that really beautiful and very important thing for me. It's really nice that you uh, have that connection to the Chen lineage as well. Yeah, well, you know what's crazy is, is that the, my first uh, Qigong instructor um, that, I, that I was introduced to uh, said that he was, yeah. you know, he, did, he said he did internal martial arts, you know, Bagua, Xingyi and those kinds of things, but said he was teaching us Chen style Tai Chi. Okay. And uh, Sinja, Sinja, the, the, oh, yeah. the yeah. so he said he was teaching Sinja, right? And then the fascinating thing happened was, was that, um, and this is a little bit of digression, but I think it's an important conversation for us to have, especially in this Qigong community and really looking at ego and those kinds of things. But anyways, him and um, his now ex-wife, she's a second generation prominent acupuncturist, you know, for years they were telling me that, uh, you know, Chris, you should do this for a living, like you should teach and open up your own clinical practice, you're a natural at this. And, you know, I was a single father, two kids, a butcher, you know, like I didn't know how I was going to do that. And once I got an opportunity after one of his classes one night, I would hang out and talk to the students if they had any questions, you know, it was on a Wednesday evening. The gal said she was a massage therapist. She goes, you know, you'd be great in our clinic in Los Gatos, California. We have acupuncture and, uh, and a chiropractor. And so it was like, okay, well, I didn't know how I was going to transition from being a butcher and a single father and uh, managing these knuckleheads and cutting up dead cows all day to healing people like it didn't make any sense to me. And so, you know, by Friday, my ego, Mike, uh, had talked myself out of, out of fear, just out of fear. And so I called her and I said, uh, I was going to tell her no. And then I seriously heard a voice say, this is your last chance this lifetime. And so I took a chance. And um, right away, I ended up by the grace of God, I ended up with a contract with Marvell Semiconductor. Uh, and I started with them when they were a very small com company, um, and I grew with them. 
And so what they were paying me, I invoiced them, you know, at the time, you know, it was pretty good. For me to teach a one hour class once a week, you know, they're paying me 13500 up front. And that's not too bad for a beginning guy getting out there, right? And anyways, long story short, that info, I think, got back to that instructor and he stopped my progression with the Tai Chi. I was scrambling because nobody would, you know, most people do Yang style. Not only Chen, but Sitja. Not too many people were teaching the 48. The guys that uh, helped build my first website, he found my Sifu, who I'm still with today, Tony Wong. And I met Tony Wong at a park in Mountain View, California, uh, Rangstorf Park, and I started to show him the form. He pauses me a quarter way into the form, and he says, you know, Chris, obviously you've learned some Tai Chi principles over the years, but this is not traditional Chen Tai Chi. He said, therefore, if you want to come and study with me, you're going to have to start from the beginning. Oh, I was so mad. And I'm being honest, I was really mad. And so what I did was I dove in to studying with him and I knew I wanted to teach. But that other instructor would demonstrate the applications or whatever, like throw the punch. That's this technique or whatever. But but no real applicable process. Yeah. No street credits. No street credits. So anyway, so so what happened was I dove in, and then that's why I started competing. And then I give public uh, demonstrations with Sifu's group. A couple of guys, most of his students are Chinese. For example, we'd be given a demonstration of the fighting techniques in uh, Chinatown in San Francisco on a stage. And... You know, next thing you know, all Washington Street was filled with people all the way up the street, you know. And I knew that there was Chinese masters in the audience. And I didn't want, the, you know, so I put so much diligence in my training. Like, I didn't want to be this guai lo that, oh, who's this guai lo that doesn't know the system, doesn't know the philosophy. My goal with comp competing wasn't necessarily, I would say, to harm somebody else. But it was more about if I was going to be teaching this stuff, I wanted to know from firsthand experience what was happening and how that was happening. And that's that's yeah. how I started competing. Yes, I understand. I mean, I noted I did a similar thing where I trained with Yang for many years and then had this transition to, to Chen and remember this. Yes, this uh, huge process of going through re having to start again, which is interesting because I think it's always... Uh, interesting to start again from the beginning there is a sort of profound difference with chen with the just the internal connection i mean of course it's teacher to teacher i'm sure there are very brilliant teachers of yang but it's it's harder i think to to find that and i think that the chen is the, the lineage has some really brilliant way ways of actually being able to really being able to help you find what where the where the the power is in, in the internal structure, which is quite a hard thing to to really really find if if you're really doing it properly. Um, so it's it's a, it's interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Similar path, different slightly. Different yeah, things. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. It seems like you guys have been living parallel lives on two different <laughs> sides of the globe. Yeah, that's pretty funny. That is funny though. Wow, what a coincidence. I. I love I love how the universe source brings, oh, brings us together yeah. in exactly the right time. Speaking of timing, let's just yeah. have a quick discussion about how it went throughout the pandemic. You know, we're practicing quote unquote alternative medicine um, and how we were able to navigate through the ups and downs of the last several years. It was quite a big thing, of course, for everybody. I think that that, that immediately that whole contraction that happens when when everybody's very in a lot of fear you notice that in in the in people's body and energy and everything else and that's the first thing of course when i was uh, learning from uh, in chinese medicine and how what i've understood over the years is that you know when you do get that pathogen whatever that pathogen is coming into your into your body um then you really see what internally there is it's a good uh, way of <laughs> being able to assess what's happening internally, really find out. Very noticeable that lots and lots of people get that and some people go into a fundamental crisis and, and it's really serious and they need to go to the hospital and some people it doesn't, you know, that their, their, their constitution or their energy is, is running 
reasonably smoothly and 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 functionally and they can they can get through and so it, it was it was always sort of very surprising that sort of approach a lot of the time focusing on these things which were going to try to get a result quickly whereas we know in chinese medicine that you have to build an immunity over a long period of time and that the energy comes into the body because you're you're relaxed and you're you're, you're fundamentally your your system is very relaxed i think that the people that i noticed where they were really struggling were people that were trying to look for those outside solutions. And I think that it may have, uh, over the time, brought people to really think about their, their body and really recognise, look, there, there isn't always a solution on the outside. Are there, is there an alternative? Are there ways of strengthening immunity, coming towards something in a different way? And I think that for some people, that has been something that has kind of influenced people to go to go in that direction. It is staggering that most people are really, that doesn't change it at all. And they're just carrying on exactly as it was before. But I think that there is a possibility, you know, an alternative, something different, another way of doing it. I think that it did bring that into light for a lot of people. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chris? Yeah, well, we didn't skip a beat. We were considered essential, and especially in Silicon Valley, they're very uptight in in the San Francisco Bay Area. When doctors were sending their patients home, I was telling my clients to come in and don't wear a mask because you're not going to get me sick. We started this thing called the Chi Club online because we saw the depression rates going up and those kinds of things. And what I tell people is, is Chinese medicine wasn't founded on fixing menstrual problems and migraines. It was really founded on viruses and these bacteria because hundreds of thousands of people were dying of these of these plagues and such. If you read the Yellow Emperor's classic of difficulties of Su Wen, you know, he talks about infectious diseases that come up, especially when seasons are not in season and those types of things. We know with natural immunity we are, uh, that if you are more susceptible than uh, buying into what we call as a fear porn, then that's going to reduce your your immune system automatically. And a lot of people don't realize the whole system has to work together, but kidneys and the lungs, you know, they really work together. And one of the main organs, one of the main organs is the lungs for our, our immune health. And But what I saw is, is that the classical formulas, herbal formulas that, uh, let's say, that we used for SARS back in 2001, were also effective for this as well, too. And so my father, who was uh, who passed away this last year from uh, complications from a stroke, not from COVID, but uh, from a stroke, back in 2020, because I had a caretaker at his, at his house 24-7, and so he was bedridden, he was obese, had his toe amputated, he had a stroke in 2017, he had diabetes, he had high blood pressure, and he had uh, AFib. So he was high risk, what they classify as high risk. And she called or she texted one day. She said, your dad has 103 fever and he can't taste and he can't smell. And I said, okay, well, those herbs that I have on the table, I want eight tablets every four hours. And she said, well, I'm going to call the VA and give him some Advil. I said, give him some Advil, call the VA, but just follow the protocol. And in three days, all of his symptoms were gone. And this is what we cons what they were classifying as a high risk, which he was. By the grace of God, if he didn't have these herbs as an intervention, probably would have not have pulled through. So I think the reality, I think like you said, is really understanding and waking up that we have this ability to con contain within ourselves, to really help ourselves, to empower ourselves, to take care of our own health care. Not, re not rely upon some external entity or force to fix it for us. And like you said, building up our immune system ahead of time, eating right, sleeping right, hydrating, supplementing right, all those things, practicing Qigong or Tai Chi or whatever, I think are essential to building up our immunity. But it's taking the ownership and recognizing and when the things first started to break, it's like, huh, this doesn't sound right. So I started doing more research. And then, and so the bottom line is, what I tell people is, is that, you don't have to believe me. All you have to do is look where the money is coming from. You trace the money and you'll understand why the push for like what it was. What's great about what I found with the, the Qigong practices, because the people that bought into the fear or got caught up into it, maybe, then the Qigong actually gave them a tool to be able to process the unknown, process the fear. 
process like now I've lost my job and I can't go to work. Process, process that, oh, I can't go see my mother or my grandmother because they're locked up indoors or whatever. You know, being able to process those emotional traumas, which further um, weaken the immune system and also create other discords in physical health as well. Ooh. Well, glad we all made it to the other side. Everyone had their uh, pandemic battle scars, so we made it, and uh, that's pretty cool. So what's going on these days? Let's just talk about your practice as it stands today? What I've been doing is doing much more focused on sort of consultation. When I was having to be online, that kind of increased. So so I did a lot more of that. And then just doing this sort of often one-on-one tuition, some classes, but often one-on-one tuition about working with Daoyin and so Qigong practices for people so that they can reclaim their own instinctive bodily health re-remember that it has become so the the more more focused thing i think being in the pandemic and and having that and i was finishing writing my my book on this subject which was this uh, principle of Daoyin, which is about reconnecting to that instinctive sense as i was doing it it sort of felt like it's all part and parcel of being in the pandemic of course and and, but I think it was the right sort of timing because I think people are, were really struggling. There is a possibility of people really wanting more of that information and understanding how they can do something themselves. And I think that that's what I was recognizing and trying to respond to. For those of us who don't know, what exactly is Dao Yin? How is it different from Tai Chi and Qigong? It's not often used word, actually, more than Qigong and, and, and other things that we heard about. But I mean, really, for me, and this is just my description of it, but I would describe Qigong as an umbrella term. We would have Nei Gung, internal ways of working with the with the body and Wai Gung were ways of working the external part of the ex- expressional part, in and yang aspects, if you like. Certain forms of qigong, especially the chin chuang, the standing p- position, are kind of like the foundation of qigong. Dao yin is something which I think is even older. I think it comes from a very sort of primordial origin. The way that I think what Dao Yin is in its essence, in its original essence. I'm not talking necessarily about forms of Dao Yin. I'm talking about where it originally came from. Essentially, the, the terminology or the words uh, describe the pictograms describing it is something where it's describing something which is uh, about a kind of spontaneous self-writing mechanism of the body, some process of the, how the body spontaneously uh, opens and resolves its its issues. There's many ways of describing it, but I would say that it's letting go into a self uh, self healing response, self or self organizing response. That is fundamentally you could reduce down to self healing, if you like. I think that lots of people talk about yin in different ways. And I'm really trying to often talk about what it is in essence and give a sort of the essential principle of Dao Yin. Where you can see this most easily, most obviously, is when you see a dog or a cat getting up from having lied in a position for a particular period of time. They get up and they their body just unravels. It just opens and they're stretching and opening like this. And it's a very spontaneous occurrence. And that to me is right there in that simple thing is the essence of everything. It's the essence of, of healing response of the body. It's completely instinctive. There's no taught aspects to, to it. Originally, if you trace Dao Yin back, they talk about it being associated with dance, uh, with a dancing movement uh, in different cultures, also a kind of uh, process of it being associated with a trance state. Fundamentally, what it is, is the body going into a movement which is associated with pleasurable sensation. So there's one principle, in my sense of Dao Yin, giving way to the pleasurable sensation within the body. Ultimately, that there's a direction through the body, a direction that the body wants to unravel. And so the principle of giving way to the direction of pleasurable sensation through the body actually for each individual in each individual moment allows that person to unravel their meridians 
in a very, very, very specific way. It's a very specific to that particular person at that particular time. And so that becomes close to what I would consider to be the origin of Qigong, the origin of, of yoga as well. Those movements that are, that are like that, spontaneous response, which people very often have when they wake up in the morning. So that, that, that morning stretch, there's something absolutely golden about that. So it's very interesting that I always found that there was this moment where you had this morning stretch and you just were just stretching spontaneously. And then after that, you go, right, now I'm going to do yoga <laughs> or now I'm going to go and do Qigong. And that is completely bypassed. And so this, for me, this was the very interesting thing because I felt that there was something in that that actually was really, really, really interesting because it's also what children do. Very young children is what animals do. And it's a process of self-regulating of the body. People who have been doing Tai Chi and Qigong from, you know, when they're three years old will also actually do this very spontaneously without thinking about it. It's something that happens naturally. It was, that's what the study for me has been about Dao Yin, reclaim that connection to that original sense. Well, wow, that's yeah. so, sign me up. So are you doing yeah. lessons now? Are you giving Dao Yin lessons? Yes, I mean, a lesson, the lessons, what I, I will call them reminders. Actually, everybody knows how to do it. It's a, it's a very, very simple, it's funny, I, you know, I wrote this book and, and I did this video and actually really, it's something that can be explained very, very, very simply. Literally, it's the morning stretch, but to just then expand it, you know, just actually will then go into that and fundamentally move towards the pleasure. It's always towards pleasurable sensation. So there's a direction that your body wants to go towards one side, which is very pleasurable to, to open and to go into. And then there's another side which the body has hardly any interest in or is painful to do so. And there's no point doing that side. So it's an interesting thing is you move towards the pleasurable side. Something opens when you move towards the pleasurable side. And you open it and open it and open it and you go deeper and deeper and deeper into that. Then when you turn to the other side, that's pain free because the, the body is a cohesive uh, unit. It's completely unified. The, the fascial system is completely unifies every aspect. So when you put when you go towards what the body wants to go towards, when you when you go towards the pleasurable part, it loosens something up, which then unlocks something else. So the body's got a navigation system. You know, I call it like a pleasure map rather than a treasure map, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is a, my jokes are, are absolutely <laughs> horrible, but it, it is a, it is a really a pleasure map. The body's got a pleasure map. If you go towards that pleasurable side, the movement towards that, that can really open things. Part of the study that I had was in Sotai therapy in, in, in Japan and associated with teachers like uh, Dr. Keizo Hashimoto and uh, Miura Hiroshi. For me, they have uncovered to a great extent of the, this as a therapeutic understanding. But actually, more vitally for, for me, this comes from our ancient heritage. And this is something that we, are, we have, we are born into. We didn't have to learn anything about. It was already in there. And just the recognition that the body actually has this system and it's based on pleasure. The most important thing is that it's based on pleasurable sensation, a way of being able to, to move into that. So it became my interest to try to talk to people about that and express that in, in different ways and, and show people that. So I show people, talk to people about it, and then they kind of get it and they understand it. And then they start to feel it themselves and start to realize that going towards pleasurable sensation in the body is a means to, to, to heal it. There's some sort of internal connection that happens. It's the, the thing that I can offer. Anyway. Wow, that's so cool. And we're going to link to David's book in the blog in the description below. Thank, Thank you, so you so much. Yeah, I can't wait for our little experiment when you guys show us two of your favorite exercises. Okay, now moving on to Mr. Chris, let's talk about what your practice is up to these days. Well, as far as far <laughs> as 
Yeah, there's a lot going on. The second book that I've been working on for the last 10 years is finally has hit the publisher on how to fix back pain yourself from the cervical spine to the lower lumbar because of, of all the diseases that I've seen throughout the years, uh, back issues are probably number one. We ended up in Los Angeles because my old friend, Hollywood physique expert Eric the Trainer, 13 years ago, I was introduced to him through my old fight coach, Kung Lee, who fought the San Show in the U UFC. Probably one of the only strike force uh, professional fighters and UFC fighters, number one being Vietnamese, but also fighting with Sancho. Normally people don't fight with Kung Fu. I met Eric and he had said that he heard how his healing Kung and all those kinds of coach Kung and all those kinds of things. And he said, nobody was doing this in LA. I said, come on, Eric, you know, there's millions of people down here. He said, no, I know the who's who. And I thought he was full of BS because so many people down here say, oh, I could connect you with this person, or I know this person, it's really not the truth, but he really did. He started giving me all of his high-profile clients, and we were, Priest and I were killing ourselves for about seven years because we had kids in school up in the San Francisco Bay Area. We didn't want to disrupt that, so we would fly down, like, on, drop the kids off at school. They'd go to their moms on the weekends, and we'd drop them off, fly out here, I see patients Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday morning, fly back before they got out of school. We did that once or twice a month for seven years. And at some point I had to ask myself, well, what's your purpose for doing this? Because the business in the Santa Clara County in the San Francisco Bay Area was doing great. And I realized that, well, the next stage of my career to spread the word about these ancient arts is television. I've actually have cut back. We have a clinical practice here in downtown Burbank in Los Angeles. But the max now that I see is probably about six patients a week now. We have a two-year mastermind program, curative program. I could teach people what I do in clinic. And then right now what's happening is, is that about several years ago, we shot a couple sizzle reels for a TV show and it didn't quite hit the mark. In 2021, 22, we shot a 15 minute short documentary that came out really, really well. And in fact, it came out so well that my team went crazy and tried to take it from Priest and myself. And I had to pull the plug on everything. We were about this close to hit the film festivals. And anyways, long story short, now that 15 minutes short is being made into a feature film and a TV series. The whole purpose of it is help to educate the world that you don't have to live with pain and chronic disease. And according to Chinese medicine, the leading cause of death and disease is emotional trauma and understanding how those emotions get stuck in different organs. And what I'm hoping for from there, because some people will get into TV and stuff like that because they want to be some movie star or whatever. Now, trust me, while I'm in this human form, I'm going to enjoy the pleasures of all that I will with non-attachment. But at the same time, my bigger, my really my deepest purpose is people to get inspired that they don't have to live with disease and chronic pain, that they don't have to live with mental health issues, that you could transform it if you just understand how the body functions. And then what I'm hoping for is then people will see the series and stuff like that and uh, people from around the world will come and study with me with this two-year mastermind program and then they'll go back out into their communities to heal other people and that's the bigger mission. Okay, just because I know you so well and we're in business together, you brought up the mastermind but also a big part of our practice is the before the mastermind is the Qigong teacher training and also the Qi club. Do you want to quickly talk about that? The Qigong teacher training is there's a level one and level two. Level one is 13 weeks. Level two is uh, 17 weeks. And it, what's great about it is, is that it's interactive online. We get people from around the world that take the course. So each week you are giving a set of four videos, a reading assignment, and then there's a small quiz each week. And the nice thing about it is, is that once you have that information, you have that information for a lifetime. And so let's say you get busy one week or whatnot, then what's great is as opposed to having to show up at our studio every week, you do it at your own pace. And then it's interactive. We do Zoom calls and those kinds of things with the students. And then at the end of the 13 weeks, then we meet for a weekend workshop where we do the practical exam and such, dive in a little bit deeper. The things that people don't talk about too much, which is uh, chi deviations and how that relates to mental health and how to rectify chi deviation. So we have that, and that's a precursor to do the two-year curative mastermind program. You have to do that because in the last 23 years I've been in clinical practice, I've subleased out to many acupuncturists or other healthcare practitioners, and it's that old thing, the wounded healer. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I have it all figured out, that I'm not wounded. I do definitely have skeletons in my closet. That's why I'm talking kind of funny right now. I'm trying to keep from one of those bones from popping out of my mouth right now. Um, <laughs> I do have my skeletons in the closet. The understanding that it's a continual life cultivation and practice. 
and we go through these layers, but too often I've seen people that are prescribing and diagnosing and they're a mess, psychologically are a mess. You have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And so anyways, that level one and level two is a prerequisite for the, the mastermind program because not only do we want people to start to peel the way the layers on themselves, but more importantly, what is chi? What is that for you? What does that feel like for you? If we're inserting a needle into somebody, well, can, can you feel that energy touch the needle? I mean, do you really have that understanding of what chi is? And so that's the reason why it's a prerequisite. But the other thing that happened, we have too, is the chi club. And again, that started during the pandemic because of that friend, Eric, the trainer. He started off with this thing called the Sleep Ninja Workout. So he would do it online and he'd have people from around the world and he'd get celebrities that come on. So Eric was this massive Jewish guy with long blonde hair and a heart of gold. He was like the connector of the people. Like he connected everybody together. You could be walking through the airport with that man and they'll stop and talk to anybody, you know? Anyways, and he would have celebrities on, you know, like Phil Collins from Def Leppard. It'd be, as he's working you out, he'd be like, okay, what are you up to, Phil? And, and stuff like that. And then what he did was he started this seven day challenges, like the seven day golden pillow challenge where you had to be in bed by nine o'clock, the seven day food curfew where you had to be done eating by 6 p.m. or something. Then he started the seven day cheat challenge. The overwhelming results of them doing Qigong with me, we continued it. And because we saw that so many people were losing their jobs, we weren't charging anything. We saw that people were losing their jobs and because we have these government contracts in Santa Clara County, we got to see the real numbers of the depression, the uh, suicide rate increase, the spousal abuse increase, child abuse, and the increase in alcoholism. That's how the Chi Club started. Now, the way that it runs is that we play the reruns Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but on Wednesday also, then Chris and I alternate each week and teach this 45 minute class. Live on Zoom. Live on Zoom. Yeah, it's really fun. So there's lots of opportunities for people to connect with both of you guys are doing such great work. And Chris, you had kind of dived into in our clinical practice, subleasing and working with different acupuncturists and you brought up the wounded healer, which brings me to my next question regarding ego in the Qigong Chinese medicine healer world. And actually, when I was preparing for this, this meeting here today, I was doing some Google searches and I found that there's one particular teacher who's been attaching his Google ad YouTube ads to both of your names. When I, when, David, when I typed your name, Chris, when I typed your name, another teacher pops up and you can see, oh, sponsored by so-and-so. I just thought it'd be fun to just quickly give us, give us your... Oh, uh, you're quick. me first? Yeah, well, I'm going to do a double spotlight. Okay. <laughs> what, okay. what are your thoughts on that? Go, go, on I'll, e I'll, I'll let you dive into that one first. Okay. 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 You, you, please, you, you take this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, you first. No, you. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, when I saw that, because this individual uh, who teaches out of Santa Cruz, California, I'd known for a while that he's been attaching his ads to uh, my YouTube page. But then when I saw that he had attached it to your YouTube page, I was like, Oh my God, this guy is tacky. And I'm just going to call it out. Yes, I guess from a business standpoint, someone would say, well, that's a cutthroat approach to getting more clients. But I think if, again, and we see this in yoga and stuff like that, you know, this idea of a guru or this teacher or whatever. I think the reality is as practitioners, there's a spiritual component. And like when you're talking about the Tao Yin, there's definitely a spiritual component to that in the spirit whatever you want to call it the Tao, god christ whatever you want to call it it's there and so i believe that we have an ethical foundation for which we need to conduct ourselves from we need to be the example uh, working together why not instead of attaching the ads why not we do like what you and i are doing today david why not work together collaborate let's have discussions and stuff like that let's promote each other's stuff as opposed to sneakily going behind and, you know, doing this. The crazy thing is that several years ago, we were at a convention in San Diego, and Lee Holden's uh, guy, I forgot his name now, but uh, he was there, and he said, well, I want to uh, talk to you about some things that I offer, and can you meet with me? And we said, sure. So we met in Santa Cruz at a tea house. Lo and behold, Lee Holden was there, but what was weird was they didn't acknowledge each other during that conversation. I'm pretty sure Lee knows who I am, too. No conversation whatsoever. And even when they, Lee left, no, he didn't come up to, what's his name, Mark? Mike, I forget his name. Ben Cox. Ben Cox. Yeah, Ben Cox. 
no conversation whatsoever. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Also, what I found too is like, for example, I actually had a guy several years ago that has a Qigong program. He came to visit. Uh, uh, we had lunch and I was talking about ego. In yoga, for example, if you've done yoga once or twice and someone says, do downward dog, it doesn't matter if you're in St. Charles, Missouri or in Walla Walla, you know what downward dog is. Now, I grant you the masters have their own private uh, practices and stuff, but why can't we come to some kind of understanding or some kind of agreement of, let's say, this movement benefits the heart or this sound, this, this sound benefits the heart. So that way it's universal. So if you're traveling around, you're like, oh, okay, I'm not having to learn 13 different variations of the of the one practice. And that man actually challenged me to a, to a fight at my studio, uh, to, to a match. And, and it uh, was the Monday after we had just watched It Man. So it was pretty funny. You know, IP Man. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, I challenge you to a duel. Yeah, and I tried to diffuse it and stuff, and then finally got to the point where I asked her, I said, is it okay if I play with him for a little bit? And then that first teacher of mine, unfortunately, I learned so much from him. And then the fact that when I first started my clinical practice, he would start off by saying, you know, like I said, he stopped me from moving forward with the Chen Tai Chi. I was doing a, um, I was doing a program with Yosan University and him here in Los Angeles, uh, an infinity program. And, he, and I completed everything, paid the $5,000 or whatever, and then he refused to test me. And then he would say to me, you know, Chris, you know, it's one thing to practice Tai Chi and Qigong. It's another thing to run a business. So let's see how long you last out there. I was like, wow. Like, it almost took the wind out of my sail when I was first starting because I was studying the teachings of uh, Taoism from uh, Master Hua Jingni. And this totally went against these principles. And then, you know, you, when you start your business, you don't, you don't have a whole bunch of students or clients, right? You don't have one client. So I started to really uh, doubt myself. Like he really started to get, you know, his, what he was saying. And plus, I'm very loyal to my teachers. What in the heck happened? And then luckily, though, what happened fast forward is Master Nee was doing a birth chart reading in Santa Monica, California. And I had a list of questions. And he answered, I swear, uh, Master Nee answered all the questions without me asking one question. And one of the questions he asked me was, was that, do you know Anna Tayam? I said, yeah, what happened with that? And he said, unfortunately, this has to do with ego. This has to do with money. Interesting question that you have there. Obviously, I have a lot to say about it because I've seen it so much. <laughs> because response. I've seen so much, so, so much of this stuff. It is like, it's like when they had the Rodney King riots down here. And Rodney King said, can't we all just get along? This gift has been tr passed to me. My job is to transfer it to other people. It's not mine. My understanding of it, you sure, might be a little bit different or comprehension. But it's, it's not mine. It belongs to all of us. And it's meant to uplift everyone not just the one yes i totally understand what you you've said and i mean i've had a lot of teachers that wanted to impose a kind of very strong egoic position people that really want to you know control or dominate or or all of those kind of things and the funny thing that I always reckon, realize or keep, you know, keeps coming up for me is, is how um, it is that process of, you know, sort of grasping wind. You know, it's, it's something that an impossibility and, you know, my own, everybody has that, those things. And I think that it's realization that the, the me state, the, the, the ego state is something that is a constant fiction, a constant state, which is is always seeking, will never find any sort of resolution. If people want to apply, I don't understand, the, unfortunately, the media system so well. I didn't know this guy was attaching his, his thing. In a way, it's kind of like coming from that place, which is trying to seek something, trying to obtain something. There isn't anything here. <laughs> there's, there's, no, you know, there's nothing really to, 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 to hold on to. With Dao Yin, like a bad joke, you know, in a certain way with Dao Yin, it's kind of like, well, you know, I haven't really got anything to actually teach you because your body knows how to do it. So we're just going to talk about how that happens. Okay, try and make money out of that. You know, I, I haven't done, so I don't know how it's, you know, my sense of it. It's almost like a compliment. It's a compliment. It's, a compliment. it's really a compliment, it's, yeah. Oh, and mm -hmm. it's like the same, like, um, the higher you climb up the ladder, the more your bottom is exposed. 
right? So you guys, are, that means in my mind, that means you guys are doing good, good work and that people are trying to attach themselves to you. And like you said, David, it's like, what is there really to attach to? Because you guys well, are Tai Chi masters. You just go empty. There's nothing to attach to. I'm definitely not a Tai Chi master. But, yeah. but, but what, what I think is, and this, is, this has been my point in the book as well, and the things that I, I, I generally talk about, is that ultimately when I see my teachers moving in with Tai Chi, it's profound beauty, you know, what, how they do it and, and very much deeper than I will ever be able to get to because I didn't start early enough to be able to actually reach that that sort of place. What is actually important to me, what really is actually important to me, is actually the pleasurable movements of the of doing it myself. And, and the actual the feeling of the pleasurable movement is the thing that, that allows me to connect to the thing that I, I like doing. And the only reason that I do it is because I like doing it. And, and there's a sort of passion that comes out of that. That's what it means to me. So I know that I do it in a board in comparison to the people that I'm connected to. But it's my wooden board, you know, it's this feeling of, of my wooden board and my wooden board feels quite nice. You know, in that way, the way that I'm doing it, the way that my body is opening relative to my own spec my own structure and what I can what I, what I can feel is, is where I am. It's what I can offer and what where I can what I can express. Everything else is completely about trying to project and trying to get somewhere, trying to be somebody. I'm not interested in trying to do that. Some of my teachers have this ideology of like trying to get up this hill and it would all be about betterments and your elders and betters and, and all of this kind of stuff. And, and as far as I'm concerned, the Tao has got nothing to do with any of that at all. It has no essence of that at all. It is absolutely and fundamentally neutral. It totally dissolves all of those kind of ideologies flat. It's completely gone for me. I love that. Okay, wow. Well, we've been talking for quite a bit. What are your two favorite exercises or practices to improve someone's energy or to release some type of emotional or mental blockage? I'm going to annoy everybody again and, and just to say, I don't have any exercises specifically because I want to show something which is Taoian. What I'm just going to do is I'm just going to follow, for me, where the pleasurable sensation in my body is, I'm gonna go towards where that is, and I'm gonna go into that, that, those areas by squeezing and stretching and opening my body. And I'm just gonna do that in the way that I, I do it in this particular moment. And this is just an example of how Dao Yin looks, but of course it can look in any way. Although you can't see the legs, it is a kind of whole body movement, but I'm just going to sit here and go into that for a few seconds so that you can see what that's like. And as I said, it's something which is clearly instinctive to the body, and it may look very kind of normal and kind of so what, but for me, it's, it's something which is kind of very useful.
Okay. That's amazing. It's like the yeah, morning stretch that yeah. just... Yeah. Just listen to your body. Yeah. 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 It's like uh, that special je ne sais quoi. <laughs> it's only it only happens once that will be the first and last time i do it like that it's specifically Correct. like that go back into doing those more or less and so on that's yeah great. that's really great. That's great yeah thank you so much mm -hmm. all right pleasure. mr chris you. your two favorite exercises my first favorite exercise i call shaking the tree because we're one of the only animals or mammals on land that does not shake it off when something happens to us you know so uh you know, whether a dog is happy to see you or is angry at you, he or she will, you know, shake from head to toe. Two ducks get into a fight. The fight lasts a few seconds. They swim away and they violently flap their wings. Why? Because they're conscious enough to know that they have that vibration inside their body. Now, they may not know that it's anger or whatever. They just feel it. So the next time somebody upsets you or you see something that's upsetting, go into another room. Really, just like what you're doing of letting your body go, that's the key here is that when you're shaking the tree, you can't, you know, going, uh, 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 because you might break something. Um, uh, but it's really letting go. So all from the ground all the way up. <sighs> Inhaling. <sighs> and then inhale. <sighs> and what I tell people is, even if you have the thought still stuck in your mind, it's letting go of the vibration because that vibration is what creates the inflammation which contributes to the, the disease process. My second favorite practice to do, I call the dry cry. The heart is the emperor, empress of the body. It dictates how much of emotion will be expressed or suppressed. So I have people focus on, imagine a pink cloud that's filling up into the heart. I want you to focus on, it could be anything. It could be loss of a loved one, it could be grief. It could even be anger or anxiety, whatever is coming up for you. Feel that, who is involved and what is involved. That's the key here. So it's almost like we're picking off the scab on the wound. We do this with past trauma as well too. So if you make it into a past trauma exercise and you focus on the situation, who's involved, what's involved, what was the environment like, were there any sounds? And the healing sound is ha because that's a heart healing sound. I lift the chin and as I make the ha sound, releasing this trauma from my heart center, I allowing it from the throat like a dark cloud going several feet away from the body and deep into the ground. So I'm going to Mindfully bring up a situation, then I'll inhale audibly. I'm going to do it audibly first. Imagine that dark cloud leaving. Inhale. Now you can do this over and over about 10 or 15 minutes. It's okay if other thoughts pop up into your mind. That's okay. Um, the key though is that if you're in public and something happens, instead of you suppressing it, saying I'll deal with it when I get home, you do the ha-ha sound underneath your breath. Make the connection with the heart, make the connection with the color and whatever's going on with you, and then just releasing it that way. So once again, both practices, good for helping to release past and present situations and or trauma and instead of suppressing it, which creates inflammation and disease, then you get to release it right then and there. Wow, I feel enlightened. Oh my gosh. That was amazing. I can't wait for us to have a 3D meeting, maybe in the south of France. I love it there. Oh. Yeah, yeah. we should go. Yeah. That's that. So this was definitely a great conversation. For more information, check out the description in the post below. We'll post David's books and how to get in touch with Chris as well. So until next time, see ya. Nice meeting you, David. Such a pleasure. Thanks for Thank taking so this, this, this call. Really yeah. appreciate you.